Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is August, the founder of Language Blend. You've heard the ads. Now you guys finally get to meet the founder. August, how you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Where are you calling in from today? So I'm in Rio Negro, which is about 45 minutes outside of Medellin. I'm kind of just in the mountains here, staying at a place, uh, like a little villa here, doing some work for a few months. Mountain villa. What's that like? <laughs> it's good. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you've been to Medellin a bunch and it's just, it's a lot there. It's busy. It's loud. It's kind of annoying. So sometimes I like to just, you know, get a, get a place in the mountains for like a month or two and just like bang out work, zero distractions, hundred percent, just on a grind and it's kind of what I've been doing for the past like month here. I mean, the place looks sick. Uh, I guess maybe some people can see the video. Some can't if they're listening to the podcast, but it's like modern double ceilings, oh, tons 12 of 12 people hot tub, 12 person hot tub. And like, no. this is the price of living in Latin America. It's like the price. If I told it's ridiculous, like it's, I'm paying like 16, 1700, I think per month, but it's like wow. ridiculous, like three bedrooms, you know, hot tub, everything. Um, that's the perks of living, you know, down here. <laughs> yeah. I like the big windows where you see, like, you like feel like you're in the jungle. Yeah. <laughs> How much do you think that would cost in the States? You're from the it, Northeast, it, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I lived in New York for like a couple of years. Obviously New York's not a fair comparison, but any, any like modern, even any suburban place in the United States is going for like three or four K a month. Easy. Um, I mean, and the view is ridiculous too. It's like, it feels like I'm in like the hills of Italy or something. It's, it's yeah, nuts. Yeah. yeah. So I was thinking to kind of kick off the, ep the episode, tell us more about language blend, the yeah, idea so behind it, how it came to be, what exactly it is. Hearing all exactly. You know, <laughs> most, most podcasts, people drop off halfway through, who knows? So yeah. we'll make sure we, we get in some shameless plug about language blend. And then yeah, the second I mean, half, we'll talk about kind of entrepreneurship more generally your story how to capitalize on latin america the future of latin america all that right. good um philosophical philosophical stuff that we do but i guess um for the uninitiated what is language blend yeah well it's super quick because this is annoying already that that i spam this podcast every week with language blend but basically it's you know i feel like learning language nowadays is hard it's annoying there's a lot of roadblocks so we just set up a program where you can basically do a class with a bunch of really fun to talk to attractive people. And it's just really easy to start conversations and just get into conversational practice and learn Spanish in a really, a really authentic way where you're speaking to you know people who are from Colombia, from Venezuela, from Argentina, and just like having conversations and, le and learning that way instead of like a more formatted way. Because like when I was learning Spanish, like I did not care whatsoever about you know, the, about reading, writing, doing things like in a business sense. I just want to come down here and talk to people. And so I guess language blend is just like set up so you can start talking to people ASAP. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the basic idea. Just start talking to people and you can have unlimited classes, uh, per, you know, per month. And I think our teachers are amazing and they're super good. And that's like why it's been good for the past year. Now you mentioned attractive which caught my attention. Am I right <laughs> that all the, all the professors or speaking partners are women? Um, yeah. So this is like something that, that people are like, why are you doing this? And it's a good question, but most got, most of our customers are guys and that's just like how it is. And we've noticed that guys do better with girls and girls do better with guys. And we don't have a lot of girls on our platform. We just have guys cause that's who we're marketing to. And they've just, what they just learn better. They just vibe better. There's no like weird macho thing happening. And it's just better. And it's, that's what we found. Um, and, and not, but it's, it's also fair to say that like most teachers are women anyways that go into this. So it's a little much easier to find them. But right now, all of our professors are women. Yeah. But it, it's just like kind of how it was. But I do think it's more effective. Interesting. And yeah, I guess no. you started with all Colombian professors and you've kind of branched out a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have some people from Argentina, Venezuela, one from Chile. Um, and it's a bunch from Colombia. That's awesome. Yeah. And what do you think is the benefit of language blend over, say, Pimsleur? Because people, that's the one people know. Uh, dude, Pimsleur's good. I don't know. Pimsleur's actually, I actually learned a lot through Pimsleur. I, I think if you just want to talk to people and you're not down here in Colombia, then you could use something like language blends to kind of like get an idea of the, 
of the vibe of like a country before you go there. I think that's a really good way to do it. Um, but I, you know, I, I just think it's one way to do it. It's not necessarily even better than Pimsleur. Um, I, the thing that is better than is Baselang, which is a very similar competitor. But uh, the reason that's not good is because they just throw a bunch of teachers at you who they pay very little and are not very like qualified teachers. Where all of our teachers have a teaching degree, um, or and they're they're legit teachers. Um, so yeah. Okay, but, this is the juicy okay. drama. I wonder if uh, what's his name, Neil, the founder of Baseline, is going to listen to this. No, no, he's you know, he's a legit guy though. He's a, he's a good businessman, and they're they're killing it. Um, but yeah, now uh, language one's better in my and, opinion. And, and coincidentally, opinion. they're also in Medellin, I think, the headquarters. Yeah, they were, they were founded here. They were founded here. So why is it better? Bring, bring me through it one more time. <laughs> I mean, this isn't this doesn't got to be a whole a whole language blend thing. Um, but I mean, they, they just you know, you, I think the, the way you learn Spanish is you get a teacher, you get the same teacher every week, you develop a program with that teacher, you develop a rapport, you're friends with them, you look forward to the classes. It's not with some random person. You develop Progression. a real relationship with the teacher. And in baseline, they give you a random teacher every time. Language blend, you can choose the same teacher that you like again and again. And I think that is the secret sauce and why it's better. Because like, you mm -hmm. can't just have a random new person every time. You have no idea where you left off. They don't know where, what, what your level is. That's just not a good way to do it, in my opinion. It saves them a lot of money, but it's not, a, not the best way to learn. That's Yeah, you know, I always thought this was weird about um, traditional education where, you know, you're in third, fourth, fifth grade, whatever, and every year you get a new math teacher and stuff. And it's like, wait, but this guy doesn't Damn. even know my level. Like last yeah. year, the guy like knew where I was at now. And, and so maybe it's similar with the, the language learning thing is like if you keep switching teachers, they don't know what you've done or yeah. – you know, you know, we've had guys on for like literally over a year, almost a year at this point, and they just they take the same teacher like every day, and it's like a little extreme for that, I, I in my opinion. But you know, they develop a good relationship with them, and they know exactly where they are, and it's just effective to learn that way. That's cool. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to mention? No, I mean, I, I, I'm <laughs> language blend. <laughs> I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate, you know, you guys listening to the spiel about it. It's annoying enough that I spam every week with, but that's the, that's the basics. I, I do think it is a legit idea in the sense that this really should have existed way long ago where there wasn't enough emphasis on actual conversation. And like Pimsleur, I think you just like walk around in your house listening to audio tracks and then like repeat or something, right? Where it's not an that's actual exactly conversation. It. Yeah. Yeah, because then you really you're not like learn, learning like to listen. You really don't know what people are saying, and it's just yeah, I don't know. It's, it's honestly not a bad way either. And like it's like a dual lingo is good too. They're good in their own ways. Um, but yeah, language minds is a, it's a good supplement if you're really serious and want to take hardcore classes. It's a good option. So but, I'll yeah. do a soft segue into how how you might think about language learning in general. I'll tell you in my personal experience. So before I learned Spanish, I learned French as a adult. Um, and learning French, I kind of learned how to learn a language so that when I approached Spanish, I had a much better system for learning Spanish. And then when I learned Portuguese after that, you know, I had the, the system pretty dialed down in terms of what worked for me. And what I noticed or what, one of my biggest epiphanies was that I wasn't listening to enough audio and mm. I wasn't listening to enough audio specifically from the country that was my target. So, for example, like when I was in Canada, I was listening to a lot of French from France and it wasn't really translating because Canadian French is so different. And then same thing with Spanish, you know, maybe you're in Colombia, but if you listen to too much stuff from Spain or from Dude, Mexico or from Argentina, you're, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good to learn the other accents eventually, but you probably, I think it's important a to listen to like a huge amount of audio, like thousands of hours of audio, and conversation kind of obviously fits in that. And then B, to focus on the dialect or the, the regional accent where you intend to spend the most time. Sounds obvious, but yeah. A hundred percent. Like there's, you know, there's a ton of countries and they all have a different accent and different, you know, ways of speaking, different phrases. And then you can get super overwhelmed and confused if you're listening to, you know, a TV show from uh, Mexico, but then you're in Colombia, but then like you visit Argentina, it's just, it gets really confusing fast. So I think, I think it's a good idea to stick with one, with one country. I, so my, my basic philosophy in language learning is 
you know, it's, 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 a, it's an impossible task to start with to learn a language. There's infinite amounts of phrases, words, everything. So, you know, you, the first thing you have to do is chop it down into something, you know, extremely, it's a very small, digestible group of things to learn. Um, and essentially just like, uh, for example, in Spanish, there's about, you know, 800 words that make up, I think like 80% of the spoken language on a daily basis. Mm. So if you can learn like, you know, those 600, six to 800 words, like you're on, you're in a really good place. Of course, there's conjugations and things that make that more complicated. But so one of the first things I, you know, tell people to do is, you know, learn those 600 words, which is, it's not an easy task. And then you can even go further and, you know, Pareto's principle, take 20% of those 600 words, and then you're going to get a lot of, you know, a lot of value just off of those, that percentage of words. So I think like it's just, I think you just really have to like funnel it down into a you know, minimum effective dose and learn that as fast as you can. Um, so then, you know, you can start having conversations and start like listening and understanding things. I don't think you should start, you know, just with a broad range, you have to really dial in into what's important, like the, the important phrases, the important words, and just like start with that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we shared tweets before where it was like the hundred most common words in a language on like one kind of uh, memory card, I guess, and been like, yeah, that's awesome. And, and then tweeted like, you should know every single one of these words, like no doubt, you know? So yeah, 80-20 yeah, makes sense, right? A million percent. Yeah. You mentioned minimum effective dose there and 80-20. I'm here. I'm catching some Tim Ferriss vibes. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely one of his like annoying. I just parrot everything that he says. I mean, you know, I feel like I feel like there was a point in a lot of people's life where it's like pre four hour work week and post four hour work week. And, you know, I think I read it when I was like 20 something in college. And I was like, OK, well, this is my life now. My life is different now. And I'm not going <laughs> to do what I thought I was going to do and like fuck my degree and anything that I had planned. because I'm just going to do this whole different thing. And I think that's like a lot of people had that same sentiment where it's like, okay, wait, like there's more that's available in, in life. You don't have to do like whatever, what everyone else is doing. And mm -hmm. I think like definitely Tim Ferriss opened my eyes to that. I, I don't, I'm not, I don't really follow him anymore, but I do like his initial work, I think with four hour work week and like four hour chef I'm super into, but that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I read the four hour work week before the four hour body even came out. Because I remember on like Tim Dot blog how he was, you know, kind of like walking us through the launch and stuff like that and the launch of the four hour chef and I was there for kind of all that. So, yeah, I mean, I think it it might have screwed me up because it might have made me not get such good grades in college because I was <laughs> like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to do any of this. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. And like even when I was in in like cause I used to work at, at Oracle as a software engineer and then I worked for Airbnb for a little bit, too. Um, and when I was there the whole time, I was like, I, I hate this. This isn't what I want to do in my life. Like, this is, I'm miserable. Like, I want to be doing this other thing. But I just, you know, I, but like, you know, my, my dad was like, you know, you have a good job. Things are going well. Like, you're making a good salary. But I feel like my mind was infected a long time ago by like Tim Ferriss. And I was like, I, I'm not happy with this. I don't care how much money I'm making. I don't care, like, if this people say this is a good job. Like, I'm still miserable and I, I don't like it. And I think, you know, in, in a way that was, it was good because, you know, it opened my eyes to, that would have been my life. If I never read that, I would have just stayed in that path and that would have been my life. And, you know, I would have been probably miserable and I would have been a very different person. So it's good in a lot of ways. Do you still code? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Like I coded language blend and uh, like crema and um, other things. Yeah. Something I want to talk about is when if we're getting into it is like, you know, Latin America is it's, it's a really big market. And a lot of my friends are like, you know, you live in Medellin, should I invest in Medellin? Like, should I buy an apartment in Medellin? And, you know, I, my answer, I, I, this might like piss a lot of people off listening to this podcast, but I don't think you should invest in real estate in Colombia. Other countries, I don't have as much experience, but Colombia, I don't. And I do think you should invest in Latin America, but just not in the typical way of thinking of inv let's invest in stocks or let's invest in real estate. I think, you know, you should be starting businesses that, you know, in some way, are around Latin America because like, for instance, you know, Latin America has, I think 660 million people. Um, and it's like the third, if, if it was a country, it would be like the second highest GDP behind America. And, and they're a very young country. I believe it's like the median age is like 31 where the median age of the United States is like 38. 
and they're all just coming online. They're all just they're just starting jobs. They're just starting to like you know come online to just realize to start buying e-commerce. Um, I think Brazil and Colombia actually have the two highest internet usages in the world, which is which was crazy to me. Um, like more than the United States, more than more than anybody. And and they there's even like they have bad like Android phones from like 2015, and they're still online all the time. So imagine yeah. when these phones are going to be you know be better. So I think like you know it's this giant wave of people that are just starting to make money. Um, and they're just coming into the workforce and they're online a lot. So like they're, I think it's that if, and, if and one of my friends have is like, a I consumer invest, culture yeah. as opposed to Asia who are like, and it's Asia, a very consumer culture. A, Asia, like they're coming online, but they're savers and Latinos are coming online, but they're right. hilariously irresponsible with money. Hilariously. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. And, and like, uh, you know, there's a culture of like, you know, debt spending and like living paycheck to paycheck a bit, which in some ways is sad, but like as a, you know, as a businessman, like, you know, like your consumers are consuming and, you know, people have told me like the internet marketing is obviously five, 10 years behind and like the ad, the cost of ads and paper clicks and, and this type oh, of it's, thing it's like, crazy is, like, it's is crazy, crazy low. low. We were paying four cents uh, for to, to get a, a CTA. It's like to get an action, whatever action we wanted. We were paying four cents per person on TikTok, which was crazy. Look, in the United States, I, we pay like five dollars or ten dollars for like a click, and in TikTok in Latin America and Colombia, it was like less than four cents every single time, um, which was nuts. So like you can, can, if you have a plan to convert those users and to monetize them some way, then you can do it for crazy cheap. Um, so like this, this other company that I helped that I co-founded, it's called Crema Social. And like we, we started two months ago. I think I told you a little bit about this, Vance. Um, it's, it's an app where basically guys in America can buy girls in Latin America lunch. And it was super easy. I, I want to talk more about like how the business, how it actually got to 200,000 users in two months, which was crazy to me. Wow. Um, because, you know, that's, that sounds like it's really hard to do to get 200,000 people to, to sign up for, um, for an app in two months. But it was the easiest thing in the world because literally all we did is we we paid we paid three to four cents per per click on TikTok, and we would just go to all these micro influencers and be like, "We'll pay you a dollar for ten thousand views if you create a video about Crema Social." And they were all just like, "Yeah, that's, I'll for sure do that. That's easy." And then they would get like, you know, maybe someone would get like a million views, and you pay them, you know, whatever. But like, it's still crazy low conversions compared to like the United States. So I just think there's this, like this giant market that is like coming online. And I think people aren't fully like aware in the United States. They're so U.S. centric because the U.S. is a huge GDP. There's a huge buyer culture. But the, the, like there's a giant market coming online in the next like 10 years, five to 10 years. And people, if they want to like be positioned correctly, they should start like thinking about how can I utilize, you know, this giant thing that's coming and like how can I position myself good for that? And it could be in a million ways. It could be, you know. Like starting businesses down here, it could be you know util utilizing them in some way, but I just think it's like a, an interesting market that's that's opening up down here. This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by Language Blend, the new best way to learn Spanish. Language Blend focuses on what you actually need to live and get by abroad with daily one-on-one -on -one lessons, a dedicated texting partner. It's like living in a Spanish-speaking country without ever leaving home. Go to languageblend.com for more information. Let's keep going with that because I think the traditional narrative that we've kind of talked about on, on Twitter or just, you know, privately among nomad friends is like make the money in the U.S. and just spend money, stay off the radar in Latin America. Don't really get involved in the local economy at all. But we're starting to see a shift where maybe people start that way, but now people are obviously, you know, buying a condo or really the better thing to do, it sounds like, is take your human capital, take your American logic and know-how and come to Latin America right. and, and make things more efficient. So, yeah. To, so the first thing, I think, I think like we're just on the cusp of the phase of these, these people starting to spend a ton of money and it being a great market. But I, th I think it still might be like, you know, it's still a couple years away from it being like super effective. So I think right now the most effective thing you can do is what, you know, Language Blend and Crema is doing, which is you use, La you, you, you get Latin American users um, for a very cheap amount and then you use them in an American market. So for example, like, you know, Language Blend has people, has the teachers from Latin America 
but then we're using them in the in the U.S. market because that was very cheap to find them. It's very cheap to pay them, and then you know you use them to make money from the U.S. audience. And then Crema is the same thing, where it's like two hundred thousand people in Latin in Colombia, Argentina, Brazil signed up and are basically you know our products on on that app for a U.S. audience. And I think right now that's like one of the best things you can do is kind of because you can you can get these users for so cheap and it's really easy to market here and get people to do things. But then it's it is hard to make them buy because they have less disposable income. But if you use them as the as the product, it sounds bad, but you know this is business. If you use them as the product and then you know to and sell that to a U.S. audience that has a lot of money, then it's like I think right, right now that's one of the best things you can do. Um, like a virtual assistant business or a call center. That would work or something like that. Call center yeah, is the like, classic one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And especially if you speak Spanish, then you can hire these people for that are so talented and such good workers and really smart for like, you know, there's like programmers down here that don't speak any English, but they're very good programmers. So if you spoke Spanish, you can probably get them for like one, one fifth or one sixth of what you would pay someone in America. And I, I do think, you know, there's just a ton of them that are like, you know, in, in our age group that just they didn't learn English and they're very good at what they do. And so if you speak Spanish, you just you know, find a ton of people that you, that can work for you that, I, and I honestly think, you know, the traditional thinking of hire someone in the Philippines or Vietnam or India or something, I think, you know, you should learn Spanish and hire people down here because it's the same time zone. The very hard workers. I think people in India have like, and also Philippines have kind of like realized that how easy it is for them to, to get, it's just like the market there is kind of weird right now. And I think this Latin market is, is a good place to start hiring people, especially if you speak Spanish, you can get really good deals, really talented people. Hmm. So tell me about how do you pronounce it? Crema? Crema? Crema, yeah. Yeah, no, the idea is like it's so ridiculous. Like it's a imagine, you know, TikTok where you're swiping and you see, you know, girls dancing, but then you can select, oh, I like this girl, I see her pictures, and then I buy her lunch. And then you have a 30 minute call, um, like a Zoom call, and we send them, we send the girl Rappy lunch, and she has lunch while you're talking to her. So it's like a it's like a date. You're having a date. Damn. Date. And it's basically like, you know, it's like 60% of girls say yes to guys right now. So it's like, you're guaranteed to have a date with, you know, an attractive girl that you like, which, you know, Tinder and Bumble and all of them have like crazy bad, like conversion rates. Like, you know, the, the dating market is so fucked up right now. Sorry. I don't know if I can swear on this, but the dating market's so bad right now because, you know, match, there's this company called match group and they bought, they, they own all of them. They, they bought uh -huh. tin, Tinder, um, hinge. Um, that they own all of the fucking dating apps and they essentially, you know, put them in such a way where they're very predatory towards guys for basically guys have to pay to play. Like they have to pay to get matches. Yeah. You need platinum, unless like you're in the top whatever. 5%. Unless like, you know, you're super model, then like you're not going to get any matches. And, um, and, and so like these companies know this and they essentially like, you know, give all the power to the girls and they make the guys pay a bunch of money to get any sort of matches. And it just makes the dating market, even in the United States, just really uneven and really difficult. And so like the idea is that there's an opportunity there where to give guys more of the power. So like, you know, they can essentially have a date with anybody. You just got to pay. Um, yeah. And, that, and that's the idea behind it. It's kind of ridiculous. And then they literally eat the lunch on the call. They're eating the lunch while you're talking to them. <laughs> And there's uh, there's live translation too. So as you know, most people don't speak English down here. So uh, you can be speaking English, you can be speaking Spanish, but there's like a live uh, translation happening at the bottom. Um, have you thought about branching out beyond food? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, no. Like, yeah. Try on these socks or something. Because <laughs> like, uh, like rabbit, you can do gifts. You can do gifts too. So we were thinking about just like adding that. But it's like, it's hard to make it, you know, it's, we don't want it to be too transactional. Like obviously a date in any sort of sense is a bit transactional, but it's accepted that, you know, a guy is going to pay for a girl's lunch if they go out to dinner or lunch. Like that's just, that's what typically happens. So it feels less transactional that way is the idea uh -huh. behind it. Um, I want to see what the marketing looks like in the Latin market. It's like, ¿Quieres que un gringo te compra el, el almuerzo? So it's, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. It's so easy. Um, like we, and honestly, we... We only like a couple of videos, you know, hit like one or two million and that would get like 10,000 downloads from people. Like it's crazy how much that idea resonated with, with girls down here. It was like a, a gringo will buy you lunch. And that idea resonated so quickly with girls. Cause like, as you know, in Latin America, it's, it's okay to be a little more transactional. It's not weird. Like in America, I think we think of it, you know, we're a little more like progressive, but down here it's like not that weird. Um, and, and the girls aren't all looking for sugar daddy. Sometimes they are, but like it's, sometimes this is just how a relationship starts. And yeah, I, I don't know. Um, we just, we think there's like a definitely a market for a new dating app because I think dating apps right now are really bad. 
and I think that you know this format of in the TikTok format is also better. And I yeah, I don't know. It's, and like the idea is resonating with girls. And at is least. is the idea that it stays online, or at some point they like get the no, WhatsApp no, so people, and then the the most like the most common use case where this has been like you know if there was a commercial for this we there was a guy who you know was in New York one of my friends and he matched with a girl had a date with her on Medellin then they they got super close like started like talking all the time eventually he went down here and now they're like dating and so that's the idea is that like you're really gonna meet people um, it's not like an OnlyFans thing it's like the idea is like this is gonna be a real relation develop into like a relationship not just like you're paying a girl and, and like OnlyFans and she doesn't care about you. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And do you, is the call happening like natively on your platform, or they get yeah. like a Zoom link, or no, no, it's like a it's a call on our platform. Wow. And you coded that. I, uh, me and uh, another dude, one of my friends. Interesting. What do they call that? Um, the the it's like an HTML five thing that allows that. The 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 call or the, yeah the integrated video. Uh, so we use uh, we use a third party to do it. So we we don't actually do the the call. Like we're using a third party that's like it's an API that we're using that does the the video processing. Okay. So like of course it's very difficult to run a whole like server that would process both videos. So we just pay to do that. What but it's just on our platform though. What a nuts concept. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, like, if I if there's one thing that anyone listening to that, like would take from this is that I do think like you, you know the Latin American audience is like is big, like they're coming online, they're very cheap to advertise to right now, which like isn't won't, won't always be the case because in America, if you go back, I'm sure you know Vance, like 50, 10, 15 years, like the PP click, the PPC like cost per click was super cheap, like but now all these companies came in and now like it costs a ton of money to advertise to anybody, and it's very difficult. And if I talk to influencers in the United States, they want three thousand dollars for a TikTok video, but in Latin America, they will be okay with like twenty dollars. Like a decent sized creator would be okay with like a twenty dollar for like you know a very solid video. So it's just like it, it, right now, it's too hard to advertise in the United States, and it's like in the ROIs just isn't there in my opinion. But in Latin America, I think we're getting there where it's actually worth it. Um, and there's like it, yeah, I think so. Hmm. So <laughs> I'm not sure how much I want to like stick on this hilarious business model versus just talk. Of, it's probably better if we just talk about Latin America in general, but I, I got to do like one or more, one or two more yeah. questions. So um, Creme, Creme Social, I'll, I'll link it up in the show notes. So, so hypothetically, you could have some girls that are accepting free lunch from like 10 guys, right? Or more? You could, yeah. And technically that's kind of what you want in some senses to like keep the girls on the platform. And then on the other side of the thing, <laughs> you, you have to attract the, the guys yeah. to the platform. I'm wondering who's harder to- It's, it's an interesting question. Which, and which, like, which customer is harder to acquire? What would your hypothesis be? Would it be that the girl is harder? Because it's, it's almost always like the, the general adage is like with a bar, a club, an app, anything. If there's an attractive girl, guys will follow. If there's hot girls, guys are going to come. That's like, that is the the idea that like, I, that I thought it was right and I think is right. So like if you can get attractive girls to do like to be in a place, then guys will be there too. Because mm -hmm. um, for example, in Tinder, it's like, I think, 70% are guys, 30% are girls, and their golden goose on Tinder is is the is an attractive girl. Like that's the most valuable user for Tinder. Is, uh -huh. is you know, that's what that's what brings the guys there. They Tinder will do anything it can to keep the attractive girl on the platform and mm -hmm. including, you know, only showing that girl really high quality profiles that have high scores. Um, and so okay, so like that was my theory going to this, which is why like the you know, if you heard like the chicken and egg problem of like a social network where it's like, yeah, how, yeah. like the, my, like my two-sided like, marketplace. Exactly. So, so right now, if I was going to be like completely honest, like the, the marketplace is pretty uneven where we have a lot of attractive hot girls from Latin America, but not as not enough guys to buy them lunch. Um, <laughs> so like the, the market is a little uneven where it's like, what's why we're, we're switching our marketing efforts to the United States because like we need these guys to, to buy them lunch. Um, because you want an even market. You want everyone happy. Because if the girls aren't getting lunch, they're not going to be happy. But it was, 
I, it was my theory that it was going to be hard to get girls, but it wasn't at all. It was super easy to get really attractive girls onto the platform. And, you know, now we just like, you know, maybe three, four weeks ago, shifted our focus to the United States. And we have a lot of guys buying lunches, like a decent amount, but it's still not even because the girls came on so fast. So we have to do what we can to like even it out. Um, yeah. So I, I think I think it's been harder to get guys from the United States because it's really hard to market to people in the United States. It's very expensive. It's very hard to, to reach them um, where it wasn't in Latin America. So even even if it is like getting attractive girls. But but the idea is, you know, guys are going to start using it. They'll see that it's so easy to have a date with a really attractive girl down here. Why would I not use that over like Tinder or something? That, that's the, the theory of how it will grow, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, to the guys <laughs> listening to this that are early adopters, I mean, they'll have the, the pick the litter, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny. And think, go, go ahead, go ahead. Because, uh, you know, like everyone has an ELO score. Each girl has a score, essentially. And like, we're basically, you know, you you if the guy, you know, was looking at her profile or messages her, you can also message and like, like it is a social network in that way. And, you know, if you message and like the girl, then like that girl's score goes up. So basically we have like a giant list of, of 200,000 girls in Latin America that are like ranked from zero to one on level of attractiveness, which is just like a funny concept to me because you guys are constantly ranking them based on, you know, if they like them, if they message them, if they buy them lunch, they get, they get mm. points. And so essentially we just have like a, a ranked list of zero to 200,000 of girls in Latin America, which is crazy. But yeah, yeah my, my thought was kind of exactly this is like when TMZ or Jezebel or some kind of like girl blog picks this up, they're going to be <laughs> able, they're going to be able to write the most nuts headlines and it'll probably be the best thing for your business, you know, like the free publicity, yeah. I guess, but yeah. the headlines they are going to be able to write are, are pretty nuts. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, I, people could definitely get mad at the idea of like, oh, a guy's going to buy a girl lunch. Like, you know, even in the United States nowadays, I think, you know, girls sometimes don't even let guys buy them lunch if, or dinner or whatever. So like the idea is definitely anti that, which, which is, which is very acceptable here in Latin America, but still in America, still we're seeing if it works. Um, yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> this is cool. Um, I hope I get a referral code or something. And I'll, I'll give you a referral code. I know you, you just had a kid, so I don't think you want to buy anybody lunch. But it, the, the idea eventually is that, you know, you'd, it'd be a business platform too. So if there's a guy, I mean, that, that would be a, the idea. Like, you know, could, you could meet anyone anyway. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit more about just starting businesses in Latin America and managing businesses, managing personnel and stuff. I'm sure you've got some good stories just about just being like how on earth like you know just like head scratch moments and stuff yeah i mean so <clears throat> i mean i moved down to medellin like a year ago like to since i've like been living here um and you know i, I bought a motorcycle down here i don't actually have like a, a house i basically go from month to month on different airbnbs which you know i think I think isn't the best way to do it, but I, I'm, I don't know if you've tried to rent down here before Vance, but it's like, they make it really difficult in Medellin specifically for foreigners to rent. And also I just think the mobility of, you know, being able to move whenever you want is, is worth it. Um, so we actually, we have an office in Loreles and we have okay. five employees who are, you know, full time. Um, and I mean, number one, it's like, you know, they, they speak some, some English, mostly Spanish. But like, you know, to, to get an office and five employees, we're, we're paying so low, which is crazy. Like to, to think you have an office and five employees and like what we're paying is like ridiculous. Like, and, and you know, it, but they're happy. They're happy as can be to have like a, a legit secure job where like they're working on something they like, which is like an app and social content. Um, and they're getting paid like, you know, decent for down here. So that, that's crazy, like that you can do that. And, you know, I think more people probably should do that. But to... There is definitely some culture shocks working with people in Latin America, as I'm sure you can imagine. Like, I'm sure you've, you've been here in Colombia and, you know, people are, you know, people in the United States are very hardcore in like what they expect and how much they work and hours they work and the things that they do. And in Latin America, like even at work, sometimes it's like I walk into the office and it seems like it's like a party and it's like, wait, this isn't, is this, is this like a party or like they have music playing, they're talking like they're working, but it's like also they're having a good time and it's just like a weird thing to, to walk into because people, you know, they just work different down here. Um, 
And I think that's like, that's one kind of hard thing. But honestly, like I, I'm pretty happy with like working with people down here. And I think like, I think like, you know, the whole culture of kill yourself to work in the U S like corporate, how, how they treat their employees is like, is wrong. And I think like treating them like friends and treating them like, you know, like it sounds stupid, but like, like a family is like, ends up being way more effective than like being treating them like a, I'm this boss that can fire you and I'm scary. Um, I, I think like in Latin culture, you're way more effective by being friendly with them. I don't think they, they respond very well to the fear tactics that, that it worked really well in the United States. I think like fear tactics have like a bad history here in Latin America and they re revolt against it very quickly. If you tried to like put on this alpha macho thing of I'll fire, you know, like do your work, I'll fire you. I think that's very not effective down here. I think you have to become very friendly with them. Very, you know, very relaxed environment. Like, you know, it's like, like, it's like very conversation just very like free flowing fun it like not a work environment it shouldn't feel like a work environment for it to be effective down here i think would be my advice which is mm -hmm. which is very like you know not what i thought coming down here which is why i struggled initially but once i got that down i think like i think it's been better mm -hmm. and I, I remember this is kind of stuck with me on twitter uh this guy calvin the panama guy said that like remote work culturally doesn't work very well for latinos and you really have to have them in an office is that kind yeah. of in your experience yeah i mean i i hate working in an office personally but i think like they need <laughs> like they they do work better when they go in and like they're social and like talking to each other and then like that creates a really good environment um i totally agree with that and it's, it's so cheap to rent an office and people like going into to the office and not to mention they don't have good computers they don't have the internet connection at home so they just simply couldn't they couldn't be effective like they need to come in to a place where it has solid internet connection, where they can like talk and, you know, we have meetings there. And I just think it's, it's way more effective to do it that way, which is, is more work for sure. Cause like, I can't just go hire someone in the Philippines. I have to be down here, have an office, you know, be on the ground, find people. But like, once you have a team and you have an office like that team and like, you know, they're friendly, they get along, they like what you're doing, they like the work. And it just ends up being infinitely more effective than if I just had five random people in the Philippines or Vietnam. That's, that's been my experience. Um, and, and I'm paying them less and I'm getting more out of them this way. If I provide them an office, provide them a whole setup, um, and I provide a couple of them computers, like then it just ends up being way more effective and it's, it's way more work. And you know, there's way more like overhead to getting this done, but long-term business-wise it's, it's been like super worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think people will be stunned that you're getting an office with five employees for probably like half the cost of one employee in the U S yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like two grand a month or something. Um, yeah, that's just crazy low. Yeah. And, and they're, they're really smart. Like they don't speak, the issue again is they don't speak English, but like if as long as you speak Spanish, you can come in there and like, you know, and work, then they realize they're just as effective and smart as any other, as any other person. They just don't speak English. And they, their, their work opportunities are really, you know, held back by that. But then you can kind of take advantage of that and give them opportunities because you do speak Spanish. So it kind of works good that way. Hey guys, quick break from the podcast to tell you about job stacking. If you're a remote or hybrid worker looking to maximize your earning potential, then Rolf Holtze, author of Job Stacking, guarantees you'll be able to double your income by implementing his paycheck multiplication layering method. This is the exact system Rolf has used to take his own income and those of many others beyond 20K a month. With this method, Rolf contractually guarantees that you'll be able to double your income in 45 days. So if you're interested in unleashing your earning potential and doubling your income, then click the link in the description and book a call with Rolf right now. Tell me a little bit more about your personal background and story, August. So you mentioned, uh, Oracle and, and engineering and, and this kind of thing. How did you get into the whole Latin America world? Yeah, I think, um, oh, I think like just one trip to like, I think I was like, like six, seven, eight years ago at this point, I went to Quito, Ecuador just for like, I was absolutely like miserable, had like no plans, like knew nothing and just like went by myself and it was just like, I just want to try Latin America because before I went to Asia and I was really obsessed with like Thailand and you know, the, Thailand has a really cool like digital nomad culture, but there was just something about it that like didn't vibe with me. I think like people in Thailand, I don't want to talk like talk badly about them, but they, there's a lot of this, this type of traveler that has 
literally they just want to go there and just like relax and like not really offer anything to like the local community or don't really want to do anything. They just want to like chill and do drugs and like have dreadlocks. And like, have you, have you been to like Chiang Mai or like Bangkok? There's a lot of that type of traveler in Southeast Asia. And I just didn't fit in when I was spending time there. But then I went to Latin America, I went to Ecuador and, you know, it just was so like raw and rough and like, you know, I, the nature was so beautiful and amazing. And um, I, you know, could speak the language somewhat better and got, got along with people better. So I was just like, okay, wait a minute. I thought that my dream was going to be to live in Thailand or Southeast Asia, but I'm actually think I fit better in South America. Hmm. Keep going. Yeah. And uh, so I, I was in uh, Ecuador. Then I went back and started my work at Airbnb. That's when I was working at Oracle, but I quit because like I was miserable um, and I was just like doing it because I thought that that was like the right thing to do. I'm sure that's like what everyone's story ever is. But it all, all along, I was thinking, how can I like, you know, break free of this and how can I like start something and not have to do this nine to five for the next like 15, 20, 25 years and be miserable. Um, and so like I started, so, like tried a bunch of side businesses and like they all failed like epically and I like wasted a bunch of money and like was in a really bad position. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go back and be a programmer again. So then I worked at Airbnb um, for like eight months and realized that like I didn't fit in there either. Then I worked with like some startups, but I after Airbnb, I moved to um, Colombia. And like after Colombia, I went to basically every country in South America, except for Venezuela, just to see if there was like one that was better, that like spoke to me more. And I, you know, I do think, I think Colombia is very good. Um, I don't think that I, it's like my forever place. I think there are countries that are better right now. Um, and Medellin in particular, like I think has a lot of issues right now. But Colombia, there's a lot of really good parts about it. And like, you know, it's cheap, it's beautiful, the weather's perfect, food's good, you know, attractive girls, I have a girlfriend, so can't say that too much. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's a solid place and it's kind of like where my home base is right now. Um, but I, I have, you know, thought about other places. I was just in Argentina and Chile a few months ago. And I think like, I think Argentina like is still a really, really good option for people. Um, I think Chile is like really slept on by the, by just our community in general, we kind of like ignore Chile that even exists mm -hmm. because it's a little more expensive, but it's honestly amazing. And I think it's really, it's, if you have a little more money, um, I think it's a really good option for people too. Um, so yeah, I, I think like something I'm going to keep trying to do is like find the next really cool hotspot of Latin America. Cause I'm not sure. I think Medellin of 2017, 2015, 2017, Medellin was like the coolest place in the world. But I think like it has gone downhill a little bit and there's been some issues with it recently um it's because so many people have come here and people have you know people I, you've, you've seen it on all over twitter like the gringo go home thing is like really big here and i think like people are starting to be bothered by that um but yeah do you think colombia is a good beginner destination for aspiring nomads yeah, I, I do. I think I think I think Medellin, Bogota um, are would be two really solid ones. Um, I'm trying to think of like the best one. I think the best one probably has to be Mexico City. If I was going to like just throw one off the top of my head, because it's you know, right now Medellin does have a problem with safety. There's like no doubt about it. Like I'm sure you've seen like all the foreigner stuff happen mm -hmm. here, um, which is honestly not to like go back and, and spam more, but like Crema, I think can because like all this is happening on Tinder. There's basically a cartel here that works off of Tinder and Bumble and they have a group of girls that message the guys and they have this whole ex extravagant plan where they take them out. They, they get to know them. It's not even like, it's not even just like a one date thing. Sometimes they like, they talk for a long time. Sometimes they have multiple dates and they have a plan where, you know, they're going to go on a date, scopamine them and bring them back to where a group of guys is going to ask for their debit card and make them send a bunch of money and beat them up a lot of and it's a ton of times what's been happening is they overdose on scopamine and the guy dies and like that's been the most common thing here so like i would say if you come to medellin or bogota right now don't use the apps don't like don't use tinder or bumble because they do have that scheme happening right now and like it's it's of course like danger in Latin America is always overblown and it's not nearly as bad. And a lot of it is just the increase in, in traffic of, of people coming here is going to lead to an increase in people, you know, things happening. But that that's like, I think that's a real, it's like a legitimate concern in Medellin right now. Um, so if I, if I was going to say like the best one, it would probably be Mexico city or like, 
uh, other, I mean, you know, Mexico way better than me. There's a ton of really cool ones in Mexico that are safe. There's a ton of dangerous ones too, but there are some safe ones. Um, or, or even Costa Rica is a really easy one. Um, Panama is a, a good one. Um, so that's definitely not my favorite, but I think Medellin's good because it's, you know, right at the t- it's right in the north. Then you you know, you have options to, to fly to Argentina, to Brazil, to all everywhere. It's like a good open, open door to the, to the rest of South America. Mm-hmm. Do you think Colombia can still be good as long as people avoid Medellin? I, yeah, I don't even think you have to avoid Medellin. I, I just think like, I, I just think, you know, just don't be dumb on dates. Like if you go on a date with somebody, make sure you really, you know, really talk to them, really know them. I just feel like guys are dumb. As you know, like if you're a digital, like if people are listening to you, then they're they're probably not the kind of person that would just go to a stupid date and just like go leave their drink and go to the bathroom. Because like, of course you don't do that on a first date and someone in Colombia, like just, I, I just think like, you know, if, if you people think a little bit more and they're not dumb and they don't just like do degenerate things like the drugs. I think our audience is pretty smart but yeah I mean a normal guy just coming off the plane from New York who's not like on social media he would have no idea those are that's those are the guys they're targeting like it's there's pretty yeah. obvious the guys that are targeting and I know it's not like the people that listen to my Latin life at all so like I'm not worried about them so in, in that case I think Medellin is has a really lot of good things um and also like you know Danger is what keeps prices down. So the prices are going to keep going down if this keeps happening. And <laughs> <laughs> that's, why it's, that's why it's okay to go to dangerous places because that's why it's cheap. And as long as you're not dumb and doing degenerate things, then like you're fine. I've been here for a year. I have a motorcycle. I've driven thousands of miles on it. Like You, you bought it in Colombia? Yeah. Yeah. Like I have it here. It's like I bought it in Colombia. Um, do, do you have residency or did you use someone else's I have, name? I have the or? Nomad. I have the Nomad visa. And nomad you, you visa. actually... I wouldn't need to even do any of that though. I didn't have to, I, I bought it before I had the visa. You can literally come down here without even a motorcycle license. I have one, but you don't need it. Come down here, buy a motorcycle. As long as you have the money, just go to, go to the runs, go to like the, um, the DMV that they have here. And they're happy as can be, as long as you're, you're paying them and it's fine. Um, wow. Cause all, all you need is a, li- a valid license, obviously in America. Wow. Or Canada. I didn't know you could, do you think it would work that way with a car? You think you could buy a car without being a resident? I, I, I think so. I, I don't quote me because you can buy property without being a resident. You, as yeah. long as, you know, it's not like you have to be like, a, like in Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, one of my buddies recently bought a motorcycle and he had to like, he just kept it in the name of the guy he bought it off. I'm like, that's okay, yeah, no, risky, I know, but <laughs> I, know in Chile, I know in Chile also, you have to buy it with somebody, a resident there. Like so that's a, it's a common law. Um, but now in Colombia, you can come down here and, and it. has it been a good country for doing the motorcycle stuff? Because the cities are pretty far between and it's just, uh, it's very mountainous, right? And, and crazy. yeah, but I mean, that's what makes it nice. That's what makes it yeah. fun and difficult. And like, it's definitely the most challenging by far riding I've ever done. Even close, like the United States is nothing compared to this. Like I was riding in like Florida and like New York where there's no mountains, but it's difficult, but that was, that's what makes it like fun and interesting and beautiful. Cause like to see all the mountains is like gorgeous. Um, I've like driven to to boat from here to Bogota to um, Cali um, to like a bunch of like little towns and stuff and yeah I mean I, I plan to like do the whole the whole um, west coast of South America at some point but I just yeah. you know have to be busy with work and stuff but what, what's your like uh, luggage setup then because I imagine so, you, so you don't have a suitcase then because you have you have things set up that you can bring everything with you on the motorcycle. Uh, so, okay, so I do have a monitor um, and I have some other things, which makes it really hard. But I, my, my girlfriend is from Colombia and she has a place here in Medellin. So I mostly just leave a bunch of stuff at her house, like my monitor and like my, a ton of my, my clothes and stuff. Um, but I really just travel with a, a carry-on and a backpack. And I do have like a few other things, but most of my travels was with a carry-on and backpack. Um, but you, you don't have a carry-on luggage thing when you're on the motorcycle. No, so I, I do. I, I put it, it's like I have like in a way bag and they're small. So basically I can put it on the back and then just like wrap it around. Oh, it's like a duffel like, thing? Yeah, exactly. So then I just okay, have a backpack, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, okay. like a small suitcase on the back of my motorcycle. My motorcycle is pretty big, so then I can just easily do that. Okay, and then just the backpack go. and the duffel bag. Yeah, and then can go cool. anywhere. And it's, it's gotcha, honestly gotcha, gotcha. super fast and super easy. Um, I, I have like, you know, two pairs of pants, two pairs of, two you know, more than two pairs of shirts. Like four, four shirts, two pants, two shorts, uh-huh. two shoes. I, I try to be super minimalistic about it where it's like, you know, I'm 30 years old. I should have more things than I have. It's kind of pathetic, but honestly, the most expensive thing I own is my motorcycle, then my computer. And that's like, 
at 30 years old, you probably should own more than that. But you know, most of my <laughs> assets, I feel like, I feel like it's better to have things like in liquid assets than like anything else. So, um, yeah. Do you have one of those rappy, the rappy driver suit where it's like the raincoat, <laughs> like the full body I raincoat? I have like a, um, I literally have it over there. It's like a, it's like a strap basically. It looks really stupid. No, but if it rains, I just get wet and it sucks, but I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, I feel like they, that's body like rain suit. It's like, a one, it's like a one piece. Uh, dude, I mean, half the point it's of like a hazmat is suit. Look cool. No, you have to look, look like, why would I have a motorcycle if I wasn't going to try to look cool? And that just totally takes away any sort of sexiness or coolness happening. No, you look sexy and then, and then <laughs> it's like starts raining or you can tell it's like about to start raining and then you put on the hazmat suit. Oh God. Yeah. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Maybe do you want to hit people with a, a recommended, um, minimal minimalist traveler kit? You said two pairs of shoes. If I had to guess, Maybe one yeah. pair of running shoes and then one pair of leather shoes. Yeah, no. So I have um, I have Chelsea boots because you know motorcycle Chelsea boots are like the perfect motorcycle boot. Um, then I just uh-huh. have a pair of sport shoes to you know gym, running, just everything else essentially. Um, mm-hmm. Then I have Lululemon pants, which are you know super super cannot recommend more highly because they they look good dressed, they look good at the gym, they look good in every situation. Then I just have a pair of of black like jeans that are like ripped that are just more like trendy. Um, then I have all ex, ex officio, uh, underwear because I think they're super good and, and socks too. Um, and then shirts is just like, uh, sometimes I just, you know, buy different shirts. I have a ton of like ASVR, um, just like gym clothes that I wear for like, I try to just like do gym clothes. Cause then I think they can look good. Like gym shirts can like look good out or look good, like in any situation. Um, and then I just have like my MacBook, AirPods, um, I'm like a super Apple fanboy, and I'm a million percent going to do the Vision Pro because my, my new work setup is going to be the Vision Pro is going to be my monitor because like I'm so sick of having to like bring this monitor everywhere, and I've broken probably five monitors in my travels in the last like wow. two years. You travel so, with the monitor. I, I do. I mean, they always break, but like I – because I'm leaving, you know, this Airbnb in like a few weeks, and like I'm going to have to – do something with this monitor but like you're that I, dude boarding a flight with a monitor under his arm oh so bad it's so bad no so i, I normally keep it here in columbia or i buy a new one if i'm at a different place um because I, I just need a monitor because as a programmer like my eyes are gonna get bad if i don't like look at the screen but um yeah my, my idea is that the vision pro could be my new monitor so then like that i can just travel with that and don't need anything else and that should hopefully be you know, that's, that's a pretty legit digital nomad setup because you can have like, you know, a bunch of screens and don't have to bring a big monitor everywhere. And that's, that's my hope. Um, yeah. Having a way suitcase and a Kodo Paxi backpack. That's super good. You ever tried the like tablet that you can attach to your computer and it acts as like a second monitor? Yeah, no, I, I, I have, I just, I feel like I'm like, I feel like as a programmer, you just need like really strong computer and like, uh, yeah. And I, I need it to be big as well because I mean, my eyesight's okay, but I'd like need to see it big or else my eyesight's not going to be okay. So I just try to use, you know, a giant monitor and my, my MacBook and just that. But yeah, fair enough. Um, I, ju- I just got a monitor. I've been in the same place for several months now, and I just got a monitor because I've never traveled with a monitor. I've always just done the Mac screen for years okay. and years. Just the I only have a 13 inch as well. 13 inch okay. Mac screen programming, VS Code, terminal, all that stuff. And I just have- I couldn't do that. My eyesight would be horrible if I had to look at a 13 inch screen. You have glasses or something? You have contacts? No, no, I do perfect yeah. eyesight. Yeah. Um, but I just got a monitor and it's, it's been pretty lit. I, right? I your life is, it's like a whole different world now. Yeah, it is. Productive and everything. Yeah, it's pretty lit. That's honestly like, that's one of the issues with being a digital nomad is like, sometimes it would be nice to have like a legit setup with like three monitors, but mm-hmm. you know, that's part of the, something you gotta, gotta give. There's gives and takes to this. And that's one of the gives for sure. Let, let's talk about gives and takes. Actually. I thought, you know, I guess, uh, according to yourself, you just hit 30. Um, normally people start having epiphanies around this yeah. time frame, whether it be around family or am I in the right place and, you know, planning the, the decade out kind of. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I feel, I feel like a lot of, you know, our group is like the same age and we're just like, okay, so what is the future look like for, for us? Because 
I, I don't think I don't think digital nomad is like is a young man's game because I think like you know I think mid twenties you're probably not making that much money so like you can't even have all that much fun maybe you're staying in hostels or like shitty Airbnbs and like this doesn't get fun to me until like you can ball out at a place the reason I'm not in like Europe right now is because I can't go to like Paris and ball out but I can do it here because you know to me this is like I'm not doing it to I'm doing it so you know you can live the best quality of life for like basically just just that to live the best quality of life and to me I can do that right here in Colombia because I can live in amazing villas and you know eat go out to eat whenever I want or do whatever I want and like have a bunch of leftover money when I couldn't do that in New York City or I couldn't do that in Boston um so I you know I don't think that this changes my my life changes a ton in the next 10 years I I don't like I I do think that I can't change I can't move every every week or every two weeks I think that life is really miserable and I think digital nomads that do that I respect them because I just I would get exhausted really quickly so I think my my way of doing things is like to stay in a place for two to three months, you know, get a routine, get a get a good gym schedule, cook like healthy food, work, you know, as much as you can. Um, I think that's a much more sustainable way to do it. And then, then move after, you know, because I get pretty bored of a place after three months, no matter what, even if I'm in like a sick, a beautiful apartment after three months, like it's just a human nature to eventually just get bored of it, which sucks. But, mm-hmm. you know, then I can go to a new place, a new awesome place. And I, I don't, I think like my thirties are going to be more of that where I'm staying at places for like three to four months. And then, you know, these, like, you know, as long as my visa and stuff is okay, then I'll just move after that. Um, either, either that, or, you know, I've, have you heard of like, you know, the golden triangle strategy where you have like three bases, like you have a property in like Colombia, have a property in Brazil and one in Argentina and basically just, you know, form three, four months at each place and just yeah, like try like that. So visas never. Yeah, so visas never expire and like you just do whatever. Um, and then like there's always like newness and because like, okay, to go back to like Tim Ferriss, like I, the thing that I will always live my life on is like the opposite of happiness isn't sadness, it's boredom. And like I a million percent think that like I get bored very quickly. So I think this life is for sure for me in, in the next 10 years. Um, I'm just trying to think of like, you know, the, the 30s. I do think like I will continue to travel and I don't plan to go back to the United States or, or anywhere else. Um, or just yeah, the United States, and I just think you know it just looks different. I'm I'm not just like I'm not in hostels. I'm not like in shitty Airbnbs. I'm not like partying every night. Like I'm living a more sustainable life now, um, just like at different places. And I'm living a better life because I, you know, making money and paying in pesos, making dollars and spending in pesos. So I I think like my next ten years looks like that, where it's like I'm living a good life with a solid routine, and mm-hmm. I'm just yeah. Is, is that where you're at too, you think? or? Yeah, you touched on three or four things that I'd, I'd want to expand on. So I'll take one of them first, which is you said, don't see myself going back to the USA. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm on your team, but you know, to play devil's advocate, why would that be? Why do, you, why do you find that life in Latin America is better and there's, you don't see the appeal than moving to the USA? Yeah. Um, so, I mean... I'm, I'm not positive that I'm going to be just in Latin America for the next like 10 years. I think Latin America for the next like few years for sure, because like all of my businesses are based here now. So I'm definitely pretty stuck, but I think like, you know, there, there's a, it is a pretty big world. Um, so I think like, I mean, right now I'm definitely just salty about United States because like the amount of like greedflation and inflation that's happened there, it just, it doesn't make sense. When I was like home, a few months ago and I went to the Whole Foods and like the bill was just, it just made me mad. And like, I shouldn't go to the grocery store and just be mad because I spent $200 on like nothing. When here I'm spending, you know, I can go a little crazy in a grocery store here. And, and, and also just like for rent and everything, it just like doesn't, it like it doesn't add up to spend that much money um, to for the quality of life. And I know that's not everything. And a lot of my family is in the United States and like I try to go back and see them as much as I can. But I think like, United States is just really out of whack right now with how much things cost. And, um, and I think like this, this, like living this way, people like can't, like my friends in the United States, they can't compete with, you know, me or my friends that live down here because they're spending so much more money on their rents, on their groceries, on everything, on gas. And like their disposable income can't go towards their businesses or can't go towards anything that's because that's, it's all, it's all being taken. And like, how can they compete with someone who's paying, you know, twelve hundred dollars for the rent and for the food and for everything, and then I have you know, like eight thousand dollars to spend on business. I'm like, they can't compete. How could they compete with that? 
Hey guys, quick break from the episode to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and many more, all paid for with crypto. BitRefill offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries all across Latin America, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MyLatinLife at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to BitRefill.com for more information. Yeah, and people say like, well, if you're in the U.S., you'd make more money to make it worth it. But for like, I, I think that that only exists at the extreme of the bell curve where like, you know, the, you can point to maybe like the 0.01% that are hundred millionaires and stuff like that. But really still 95% of people are, are maxing out at like 250 K a year or something like that. Right. And so there is sort of like a limit on salaries and, you know, so the math doesn't really work to be in the U S considering that like most people aren't making like 400 K type of thing. And, and they kind of like dangle it as a carrot in front of you and being like, you could make 2 million a year or whatever, but not really that many people are doing that. No, definitely not. And let me also say that like, so one of my friends works up, he's one of my best friends. He works at BlackRock. He's in, you know, Upper East Side and he makes stupid amounts of money and he's, you know, also 30, but this is going to sound stupid, but like if you, for if all in your twenties, you follow that corporate path, you live that life, you work the 70 hour weeks, then you, you didn't develop as a person. You did nothing for all of those 10 years. You are like such a, like such a unidirectional person that has like no layers, like your whole layer is just finance and just that life. And then, you know, I think that sets you up really bad for your thirties because then your whole life is just, has been this one thing. And so even if you do make 250 K a year at 30, you sacrifice like becoming the best person that you can be and like setting yourself up for, you know, your next part of your life. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, yeah, I I just think those kind of people are like kind of boring. I'm not, this isn't everybody, but this is like, you know, he's one of my closest friends, but honestly he would be the first to say that his whole life is like, yeah, it's just been a zombie life. And, and I, you know, so back to Tim Ferriss, the whole thing, I think, you know, money that is, that is not related to location that is location independent and also asynchronous that you can, you know, make from anywhere and do whenever I think is worth three to four times the amount of money of Mm -hmm. being tied to a nine to five job. So if you're making, you know, if you're making 50 K, but it's, you know, remote and asynchronous, I think that's worth, you know, 150 K worldwide. I really, I really truthfully do. I I agree with that. We've had tweets where where it was like, um, it's like you should be willing to accept a 50% pay cut at any level. It's like a million in the US, 500 independent, obviously 500 independent, like 250 US or 125 independent, obviously independent, even yeah. 60K US, 30K independent, obviously you'd rather 30K independent, yeah. you know, so really at every single income level, what, whether it's at the lowest levels or the mid or the high at, at every tier, you should be willing to accept a 50% pay cut to work remotely. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think, I think even more, I know it sounds, it sounds ridiculous, especially if you can make it asynchronous too, where, you know, you don't have to do the work at a, a certain time. You can do it like when you, whenever you want. Yeah. And I think that kind of work is like, is worth so much. Yeah, 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 I agree. What if prices were the exact same? Would you still do LATAM for the vibes and the salsa and the emotion, the emotion? Or if it's a really good question. Um, I mean, part of the reason half, some of the reason this works is because of obviously the price discrepancy, but like, you know, with Petro is like doing, has a whole, the president of Columbia has a whole, you know, initiative to kind of increase the the value of the peso. And and it has like, you know, interest rates here in Columbia are like 15%. I think my girlfriend keeps her, her money in a bank that gives her 15% per year on an interest rate, which is like stupidly high. And of course, a lot of foreign people came in and put their money in, which has gotten, you know, made the Colombian peso pretty high. And, you know, I, although I don't see a future where like it's ever at the same as the US dollar, um, I, I do think that like it's it's already, you know, when I first came uh, like a year and a half ago, it was like 5,000 pesos for a dollar. And now it's like 30 something. I'm like 36, maybe 37. So... Um, and I'm still here. 
So I, I do think like, I think it would take a, if it was the exact same, I would definitely double think it because there's, you know, some things like danger, being away from family, um, you know, I guess just those are the two main setbacks. And I'm really not worried about danger and my family is like kind of toxic, so I'm okay right now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I wouldn't move. I wouldn't move. I, I probably would think, you know, long-term, is there a better place to be? But I, I'd be happy here for the next like, year or so or a couple of years it's a good question though i i do think there are still benefits like the intangible benefits to latam i think people treat each other with more decency i For love sure. the like buenos dias uh con permiso all that type yeah. of stuff the the manners i really love that and Columbia and medellin is so good about that medellin was definitely one of, one of the most friendly cities like in the world in my opinion um like, you know, you'd be talking to just some random person on the street and they're just like so happy to talk to you or help you with anything and, you know, call you me and more. And they're just like the nicest person in the world. Um, and that's definitely the, the, the vibe here. I want to pick up on the, the Tim Ferriss thing you said, which is that uh, you, you phrased it in a way I hadn't heard him say it. I'm not denying he has, but I always heard it as basically follow your enthusiasm, which is like you're going to just naturally have a more of like a zest for life and you're going to do better if you just follow your enthusiasm as opposed to like what you're supposed to do. And so that's something that I've really, really taken to heart. And, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you've heard Derek Sivers, hell yes or no. Yeah. Have you ever heard that one? Yeah, I have. So I, yeah, I really, uh, I really stick to that hell yes or no thing. Yeah, no, I think that I think that makes sense. Um, I think I definitely agree with you. Um, I think just the, the are you talking about like the, the boredom comment? You I said made? boredom, you said boredom. And so I kind of rephrase boredom as, you know, where is your enthusiasm? And yeah, I guess like avoiding boredom. Um, yeah, I, I think it's huge. I, yeah, I think that I think there's the one in the same essentially where if you're enthusiastic about something, you're not going to get bored. I honestly, and maybe that's even a better way to put it, because if you're enthusiastic about your work or whatever, it's, you're never going to get bored and like you're going to be way happier. Um, I, I just I, I'll say that like there there comes a level with some people that, you know, especially when you're first getting into this, that you might have to accept some non enthusiastic work like some, you know, if you take a remote job for 50K with some tech company um, just to get into this world. I think, you know, sometimes you're going to have to do some work that's not like you're not super happy about, but I think like it's still worth it. I think, you know, you're, you're going to have to do some work, but it's still worth the, the trade off of like, you know, being able to live anywhere and then like the, in the meantime, develop the life that you can, you know, break free from that and then work on something you're really enthusiastic about, like, you know, like what you work on or whatever. Um, but just to start, you know, maybe you, I think like, I think a trap would be to say, you know, go right into, you know, you just graduated college or something and just go right into what you're super enthusiastic about. I think that that can be hard. Like a path that I took, which I don't know, I, I guess is, was okay. It was like, I worked a bullshit corporate job at Oracle and Airbnb for like four years. And you know, there's four years in my twenties that like, I'm not getting back and I'm not super happy about it, but you, you know, your early twenties, you kind of are, you can be kind of stupid. You can like make some bad decisions. So I think taking, you know, making the sacrifices of, okay, I'm going to do this to save up some money, to build some some businesses in the background. I'm going to use my my money that I make to, you know, build something so I can do this. I think that that's good too. Um, Pay your dues a bit. Yeah. You, you really wouldn't, like if you had a, a younger cousin or something who was like, hey, August, I'm thinking about going to college or maybe it, now people are telling me to become a plumber or do a trade or... Mm -hmm. I want to just, I want to hook up with you in Columbia, age 18. I'm going to squeak out some money online and I'm down to make it work. Which, which kind of path of those three would you say? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I think like it would definitely matter the person, like the, the guy doing it. Like I, I'm all for betting on yourself a million percent. Like I think 401ks are fucking stupid because it's not betting on yourself. It's betting on the government. It's betting on, I, I think everyone should bet on themselves almost a hundred percent of the time. I think that's a good thing. But at dude, 18 or 19, if unless I have like a real backup plan, I think 18, 19, it's, it's going to be really hard to make that work unless like you're really, really know what you're doing. Why, um, why is it, that? What's hard about it? It's not, it's not a bad idea just to put in your dues and learn a little bit. I, I'm just mostly imagining me at 19 or 18 and like I was just like as dumb as I as can be and like the decisions I made were bad and business. I mean, I'd be like, I'd be like, okay, you got a laptop, right? All right. 2000 yeah. bucks a month. You're going to be my assistant. 
you're gonna handle some social media accounts blah 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 like yeah no honestly it's something i haven't really like put a ton of thought in but it's you, you make a good point if you are that age and you you know you're online and like you're smart about things like there's there's no reason you couldn't make it work there's 100 percent. i honestly a lot a lot of me like regrets like i'm a programmer and i was a computer science major but i learned everything i don't know if, if you were also a computer science major but i learned everything after that degree like i learned nothing in those four years and i spent a bunch of money and paid a bunch of college loans for literally nothing and i do sometimes think okay what if i just you know had you know, 10K in savings, which I didn't at all. But if I did have 10, I, I think like, you know, to do that, you would need at least like 10, 15, 20K in savings just to, to not be so dumb. Um, Cause you, you can, you know, you know, you can live down here for a thousand dollars a month if you need to a hundred percent for 1500 a month. Um, sometimes I do think like what would happen if I just winged it and did that and maybe I'd be further along. Maybe I, I wasted those four years. So it's a good question. Yeah. I think about it too. I guess, it's like a maturity level thing, but there's no reason if you can click buttons on a computer and have half a brain that you couldn't do this even at like 16. No, you're right. hundred percent. I definitely would not discourage someone from trying that. Like if, you know, they had a little bit of savings and the will to do this and like we're willing to hustle and just get it done, then you really only need to make 1500 bucks a month to make this life work. Especially if you have no bills or no loans or no anything, then like you really can, you know, go to a really cheap there's airbnbs here in, in, in medellin that are like 500 bucks a month that are not bad at all and yeah. then you know another 500 for, for food and then another 500 just for fun and then like you're good you're not saving yeah. anything but like you know it's a could be a learning experience um not easily for sure um <laughs> the takeaway from this episode is gonna be uh buy girls lunch and then uh <laughs> <laughs> and then drop out of college and uh, meet up with them. Uh, <laughs> um, so what do you th what do you think is going, you know, because I guess we're kind of hopping around talking between like the perspective of a aspiring digital nomad versus someone that's been doing it for five years. And they're kind of like, you know what, I'm pretty used to the whole one month Airbnb thing and hopping around, you know, the big four or five countries. And now it's kind of like, hmm, I kind of need to take things to the next level. So I know, I know we've been kind of like hopping around those two perspectives. So maybe it is, um, maybe it is worth mentioning, I guess you, you, you said that like a lot of guys you think are struggling this when they hit their thirties, because I think, um, to back this up, like, um, you know, working online really only hit its speed in 2018, 19, right. 20. Right. And so anyone that was just by virtue of being born, you know, before 1995 or something, they're already like in their thirties. Um, and so they never got to experience Latin America as a young guy. So I think people really getting to experience Latin America as a young, as like a young guy, like 21 type of thing, and being able to sustainably do it as a digital nomad is is actually like a very new thing or new option that's out there for people. That's that's so true. Like when when I was twenty one, like there was I, I don't know how I could have done this. I don't think I could have yeah. nine years ago, um, unless I had like family money or something. Um, and so by definition, a lot of the digital nomads right now are kind of like in their early thirties, and and they're like, damn, like it's kind of time to start a family and. <laughs> I think, I don't know if you were going somewhere else with it, but I think it's, I think it's nice. I think, I think raising a family in Latin America is, is so much better than in the United States. I can't even, I, I am not one to speak about this because I have zero experience, but like number one, to have a kid that's bilingual is going to be amazing to have a kid that's has a different, you know, a different viewpoint on the world where you're, you know, you do not just uh, Americans are so like America centric and I'm, I, Canadians are too, I believe where like, you know, you, the whole world is America or Canada and like, just to, to realize there's more to it than that is awesome. And not to like the, the biggest thing is the is how common it is to to hire like people to help you in Latin America. It's so easy yeah. to hire a babysitter so you can actually Maze. work yeah. um, and it can also cook for you. And like it's so affordable. And I think it just makes it easier, so much easier to raise a kid um, and also, you know, be present there for your kid, but also keep your, you know, keep your work life balance like good. Um, which a lot of my friends in the United States who have kids, one of my best friends has four kids and like his life is hard. It's so difficult. Like he's makes in the no US. Time. Yeah. In the U S and he pay, they pay a nanny and they pay her like 
three thousand dollars for barely showing up three thousand dollars a month for barely showing up whereas i was telling them like you can get a whole team of people in latin america to help you take care of the kids for three thousand dollars a month and in like colombia or mexico or anywhere basically in latin america so mm-hmm. i do think if i get to the point where i'm gonna have kids i think like i would not even think twice to not do it in the united states mm-hmm. purely based on the like the maid situation or you think there's a <laughs> yeah that sounds kind of bad but um, no it's I mean, totally true it's, it's totally true i have a maid and it's like the biggest game changer it's, of, it's like my life. game changer it's a huge yeah, thing yeah. but i think also more than that the to make them without the risk of sounding like super pretentious like a citizen of the world where like they would be traveling like i would want to travel with a kid to other places because something you know that i my parents didn't do is like you know make just do that and i, I think that would be amazing um you know, where the kid is speaking multiple languages, like, you know, your kid could probably speak, you know, three languages by the time they're like five, which is amazing. Such a, with such an advantage in life. And I think it's such a cool way to raise a kid. Yeah, that was a very like open-ended, I didn't even know where I was going with that. But um, I, I, I truly believe that there's something at every, um, at every life stage for people in Latin America. Like if you're in your twenties and dating, Latin America, obviously clear winner. If you're uh, raising a family in your 30s or 40s, Latin America, clear winner for the help and the low cost of living, low cost, of easy, a better health care, better health care is huge. And then for retirement age people, again, Latin America, clear winner because cost your pension, of cost of living, your pension will go further. Again, yeah. the help, again, if you need uh like elder care or yeah, the elder care thing is, is huge too like i told both my parents already like separately that you know if if you guys do come to that point like you guys are coming down here in latin america and i'm hiring full help for you like i'm not i'm not paying ten thousand dollars a month for you to be in a nursing home where they treat you like garbage like you're gonna get like dedicated care here for you know very very cheap and like you can live by you know live in the jungle or by a beach and they're, yeah. they're both good with it. And I think like, that's a, that's a really smart solution for people too. Um, yeah, I, I'm hundred percent agree. Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, as we kind of get to wrapping up, it, it's, uh, really interesting to see your path. Cause I think your path is reflective of a lot of people's where, um, you know, you come down, you're, you're doing the, earn USD, spend pesos thing, the geo arbitrage, working for a US company. First couple of years, you're maybe kind of more having fun and and jumping around and stuff. And now you're like, oh, I've actually spotted some opportunity. Now I'm going to actually start a business in Latin America. And what's ironic is you're taking the money that you've made in the US and not only are you spending it as a consumer, but now you're investing it into businesses, you're hiring people, you're giving people oh, yeah. directly giving people jobs. And um, it's uh, an interesting progression to watch. Yeah. And that, that's honestly, what's so annoying about, you know, people here in Medellin, like the gringo go home thing is like, you know, there, there are a lot of bad gringos that come here and do de- degenerate things a million percent. But then there's like, you know, another side of it, like you're, you know, people who follow you um, that, you know, are want to can, can actually like contribute back to the economy and can like help fuel growth here and can like help people and like give a ton of money to like local people through like you know businesses and through like you know i i don't know i don't i don't fully get the the whole you know pushback on gringos coming to latin america and i i think they're i think it's just been a swing because a lot of guys have come down here and like treated you know latinas badly um you know whether it's like old married guys or like young kids um, that are just down here like on a bachelor party or something so i think like i think it's okay that it's happened i just don't think that it's gonna last for too long and i, I think that like there, there are a lot of people who are here to do good things and yeah that's been one of my, my issues with, with colombia and medellin but i think like it's it's getting better yeah definitely so what do you see as uh your the future of uh language blend and of creme social social <laughs> Uh, so I mean, language blend like the I, I would like to open it up to Portuguese and then even French because there are a, a ton of people here in Latin America that speak very good French. So then like you'd be being taught French by someone here in Latin America, and Portuguese is is the obvious one because like I I would like it to be a platform where you can learn a ton of languages because like you know like you and our followers like 
we we don't just it's not just about spanish it's about everything it's about all the languages and like it'd be super cool if one day i was taking spanish lessons the next day i'm taking portuguese the next day italian the next day french so like i would like to open it up to more languages um and with with trama i don't, I don't know I, the ultimate goal is to take down tinder but that's obviously very lofty um but we'll see i'd be down <laughs> yeah, I feel like it'd be easy to add. Like, you just find someone who speaks Italian. You're like, yeah, you know what? We'll just open that. No, up. Like a ton of like actually, two of our teachers already speak uh, like French, like at a level that would be proficient enough to teach. Um, and one of them already speaks like Portuguese. So, like, it would it would be so easy to to open this up to to those languages if there's a market for it. And I think like that's actually a cooler product where you can you know learn a ton of different languages at for one price and whenever you want. Um, yeah awesome dude um any uh last message that you'd like to share to the audience um no i mean i think like you know what you said is, is great like you know if you if you want to do this life you should just do it if you got to put some put some work in for a couple of years that's okay don't get discouraged like just keep the goal in mind and i i think like i think the time we're in a very or an inflection point in history where like the Latin American market is going to blow up in the next like five years. And I think like we're just at the cusp of it. And I think like a lot of companies aren't even trying to break into this market. So the competition is low. And I think like, you know, if you're online, you're savvy, I think you can really do some amazing things here in Latin America, whether, whether it's selling to the, to the market, selling, you know, there's a million ways to sell to this market or, or around it. And I think like it's a really, it's a, it's a blue ocean, I think. And it's only going to get bigger. So I would say keep keep looking into it and yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I think we'll have to do like a round table episode where we get entrepreneurs that are investing locally in, in the countries on. And yeah, and, and talking talk about, about like the best that. ways because you no, know, there's other people who have a ton of good different ideas and maybe I'm wrong about real estate. I don't know. This has been my experience. I think like the ROI is not there compared to like US real estate market, but I know a ton of like your followers and a ton of other people on Twitter talk really highly of it but um there's a million ways to, to do this and i just think like it's a wave that people shouldn't miss if they're you know and they're already they're listening to you then they're, they're probably not but yeah no i totally get it like even like a random clothing business some, something you know a ton a ton of things yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just crazy how how online these people are and how more are, are coming online and they're just they're just reaching the age where they have money to spend because as you know people they they graduate college here like around 24 25 and they don't start making real money until late 20s early 30s which is basically that market that's like just there there's a, so many of them that are just get reaching that age where they have money they're online they're ready to spend and I think like it's just such a good opportunity for people to, to start taking advantage of that. Agreed, agreed. So languageblend.com, everyone can go sign up for unlimited Spanish lessons. And honestly, if you're serious about Latin America, living in Latin America, um, to me, it's an absolute no brainer that people should be taking these lessons like well worth it. Like I think about like, like if you just did the math, okay, if I did like five, six months, maybe that, you know, seven months is like, what, like a thousand bucks and seven months of near daily lessons. Like you'd be friggin' fluent. Yeah, and, I, and so well, people from, from zero are getting conversational in three months consistently, consistently. Like we, we've had at least four or five people go from zero to very conversational in three months. Um, yeah, it's like, it's a no brainer. Would you pay 500 bucks to get conversational in Spanish? Would you pay a thousand bucks to get like B2 level, basically. Yeah. No brainer. Yeah. Huge. And then Creme Social is on yeah, both. Yeah, social. You can download Creme. it in an App Store. An both Android. App Stores? Yeah, both App Stores. Um, Epic. Yeah. There's a lot of attractive girls that want to be bought lunch and, and not many guys buying them. So so go check it out. Go if, if anything else, just check it out and like and give me any feedback on like any of my socials or anything. Um any anything at all. But the, yeah, it's uh it's available to download now so i'm just buying like a lollipop <laughs> uh, we, we probably should do a, a smaller option so it's not just it's 20 dollars right now for the lunch option um we should probably should do something quicker and, and easier but yeah we'll see how it goes <laughs> <laughs> cool I, I i think that's really cool um cool man so again august co-founder language blend this has been another episode of the My Latin Life Podcast. Thank you, August, for joining us. Thank you to the audience.
for listening. And uh, don't exit your browser uh, as this uh, uploads real quick. Awesome.